So hello to everyone. I have the pleasure to welcome you to a new EasyChem chat. And today I have in line my friend Jean-Baptiste Lascaru from Nantes. Hi, Jean-Baptiste. Um, uh, I invited Jean-Baptiste to, to talk about uh, recent guidelines on the use of uh, targeted temperature management in uh, cardiac arrest. So I start with the first question, Jean-Baptiste. Um, we said in the guidelines that uh, we recommend to measure continuously body temperature in cardiac arrest. So my question is, is body temperature so important in these patients? Yeah, I, I think it's quite sure because um, the, the main, uh, the first step to, to improve the, the prognosis of those patients is to measure the, some, some kind of, uh, of uh, baseline characteristic and physiological variables. And I, I think for those patients, temperature is the cornerstone and, and also the, the main step like uh, for uh, mean arterial pressure and, uh, and the heart, uh, heart rhythm. So I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a well done to, to put this in, in the in the in the next in the in the first uh, step of, of the of the guideline, which is something that maybe in some centers people do not um, do properly. At least we, we don't know, but <laughs> it's yeah. possible that people are not interested. Now, this is a good practice recommendation, and uh, the second recommendation, which is let's say low quality of evidence, is that experts say that we should. Uh, actively prevent fever in cardiac arrest patients. Do you agree with that? Um, which is the evidence suggesting that? Because this is low evidence, but uh, is it something we, sh we should do to in every patient or some patients? I, I, I think it depends on the, um, of the, of the prognosis of the patient, because we have a, um, a balance between the, always between the intervention and between the benefit of those interventions. And for, uh, I think for most of patients after cardiac arrest, it's very uh, careful recommendation to, to, to avoid fever and to actively prevent avoid fever. Because if you are uh, too late and you are not very uh, early in, the, in your therapeutics, you, you will lose some time and the prognosis will be already infected. So uh, I think we met uh, at least the, the TTM1 and the TTM2 trial show to us that it's, uh, um, uh, it's safe to, to prevent fever. Uh, even it's um, quite indicated for a subpopulation of patients is another question. But I think for all patients after cardiac arrest, if the patient is not awake, because if it's awake, we, we can allow fever probably for this patient. Uh, but if it is not awake, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a good measure. And I think it's uh, the first question of, with that is the, the, um, the sedatives, because we didn't have enough data to, to give some guidelines to recommend early sedation or, or late sedation. Can we give some time to, to the patient to awake after cardiac arrest? Or is it possible? It's not uh, always the same thing to be in the, in the EMS with uh, only one nurse, uh, whereas as compared to in the ICU with uh, with uh, some colleagues and some uh, other enough. So I, I think it's, uh, it's uh, under uh, in an area under uh, covered by, by clinical research. So you mentioned two points, basically. The first one is that uh, probably controlling fever should be the standard of care in any patients. And then that in all the clinical studies, all these patients, whatever is the level of temperature being used, they were under sedatives. So we cannot, of course, distinguish between the effect of sedatives or not sedatives. Now, my point would be as a researcher and a trialist, because you are, of course, the first author and the PI of the Hyperon study that have investigated the TTM in a specific patient population, do you think that we are ready to compare, let's say, preventing fever versus not preventing fever, leaving patients febrile after cardiac arrest? This is the way to go, to confirm that this is really the standard of care that the fever control matters. I, I think um, it depends on the patient that we will target in, in those uh, RCT. Because uh, we know, uh, if, if I, uh, I made a parallel with, uh, with septic shock, we know that the prognosis of patient with uh, uh, IRDS is not the same that with the uh, urinary tract infection. And it's not the same to, to, to put all those patients in the same uh, septic shock trial. So I think we, we need to shift uh, our way of thinking and how to perform um, clinical research on cardiac arrest because it's not the same to have um, a patient with a, 
uh, ventricular fibrillation uh, from uh, ischemic cause with uh, early coronarography uh, as compared to a patient hanging or, or uh, another hypoxic cardiac arrest. So it's quite difficult to put all those patients in the same, uh, in the same trial. Even we think about uh, um, stratification and subgroup analysis as always done, um, uh, we need probably to better select those patients and we need to have some uh, adequate tools to, to, to perform this selection. Do, do you think that this is the reasons why in the guidelines we open, we leave this uh, open door to the fact that in some patients we might still use TTM at lower body temperature? Is this because maybe the studies are too much focused on some patient's population? We don't have the response for everyone? Uh, quite difficult question. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe because um, in other way, we didn't succeed in the tailoring TTM for, for those patients, but we have a lot of data for patients with, um, with a relatively good prognosis, patients with a cardiac arrest from cardiac cause, and especially uh, uh, behind the witness. Um, and uh, uh, as, as uh, uh, um, for example, the patients on the, on the duration, we have only one good trial performed on the, the, the TGM duration, um, the, the rewarming. So uh, I, I think we need have to, two way in parallel, the way for the patient with good prognosis and the way for the other. And uh, maybe the, the, the trial dedicated to avoiding fever and uh, um, as comparing avoiding fever to no intervention can be delivered in patients with very good prognosis. Uh, but I, I think for me, I, I will not agree to be in the, in the do trial for patients with bad prognosis because we have uh, um, uh, even the data are not maybe the better. Uh, we have uh, strong data on animal experimentation. We have the 2002 uh, trial, uh, well done, uh, especially the, the, the trial from the Europe. Um, and we have um, uh, no um, safety signal in TTM1 or TTM2. Maybe in TTM2, there is a safety signal regarding arrhythmia. So patients who suffer from cardiac arrest with arrhythmia as the primary cause of uh, cardiac arrest, maybe we need to, to be very careful to perform TTM at 33 or 34 for those patients. But for the other, there are no very uh, um, strong signal for safety. I think that you made a very good point uh, among uh, the others about patient selection, because you said it's quite illogical to think that cardiac arrest patients are all the same. And so it's illogical to think that TTM at 33, for example, would work in everyone. So, of course, I know that we don't have the question. It's a matter of thing we discuss very frequently at the Congress. Which are the tools that you would see, in your opinion, when the patients arrive at the hospital to stratify whether these patients has uh, enough injury to go into a trial and not too extended to benefit from the intervention? I think we have um, several candidates. So we need to, to, to perform uh, RCTs to, to test such candidates. The first one is the uh, global score, uh, such as the Einstein style um, um, criteria. We have uh, some score, like in, in France, we would have the, the CAT score from, uh, from MOPA, uh, published in the European uh, Earth Journal. We have also another score uh, dedicated from the, the patient included in the TGM. The Japanese the colleagues have the AirCAT, which is some, some good evidence always. So we need to, to have strong data to, to, to know if there is a, a score better than the other one. And after that, we have some biomarkers. Maybe um, it was uh, quite difficult to have uh, interleukin-6 dosage um, very early, but uh, thanks to the, to the COVID-19, it's, uh, it's easier today. So maybe we can test some kind of biomarkers and maybe the neural filament, even there are very few data indicating that maybe they are not the better candidate. So uh, I think we need maybe to, to, to uh, uh, go back to the first step, which is the, the selection of those patients before to perform another trial on TTM, uh, on, on TTM for, for all those patients, because we need to, to very uh, rightly, shiftly your way of thinking about cardiac arrest, because uh, cardiac arrest is not a, uh, 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 disease is a syndrome like IRDS and uh, in IRDS some colleagues um, succeed to, to perform phenotyping uh, studies so maybe we can uh, talk about that for, for cardiac arrest uh, RCT. 
with uh, keeping this in mind about the need to create subgroup or predefined subgroups to be analyzed, which would be uh, the field in the cardiac arrest where you feel the TTM should be further studied? The patient's population, the situation, the diseases, the causes of arrest, where we don't have enough data, we still need to provide additional studies, maybe to enrich the future guidelines. In my mind, it's, it's the, uh, maybe uh, the non trackable cardiac arrest and especially cardiac arrest from non-cardiac cause. Because uh, I think they are the, the, the forgetted patient from the cardiac arrest trial, because there are, uh, um, even if not enough, uh, but there are some trials dedicated to cardiac cause, so there are very few trials dedicated to non-cardiac cause. It's increasing in, in registry data, we know the increasing uh, number of those patients. So, so we need to, to focus uh, on those patients uh, also. I have a last question for you, which is a very practical one. As uh, the guidelines say that it's still an open door to use um, lower TTM at 33 degrees. In your practice, which are the patients that, for example, you still use TTM 33 degrees um, when they suffer from uh, post-anoxic brain injury? Yeah, in um, our local ICU, we are always uh, talking about colleagues because we need to, to have good adherence from all colleagues in the ICU. But I, I think we will uh, move to um, avoiding fever from, for patients from non shockable rhythm. And we need to, uh, and we stay at 33 for patients with, um, uh, sorry, we, we will uh, keep up for 37 for patients with shockable cardiac rhythm. And we will still uh, stay at 33 for uh, cardiac arrest in non shockable rhythm. Do you think that this might be a challenge for your uh, ICU team having two or three protocols? Is it so complex to apply and maybe increase the risk of errors? Yeah, yeah, probably. But it's, um, as, uh, as discussed at the beginning, it's a balance between the individual benefits for the patient that you uh, will cool and the other one who can uh, have uh, some kinds of difficulty with the, with the protocol. So it's always uh, uh, about that. So but we need to really uh, give some insight to the nurse, to the assistant nurse, to our colleague, maybe uh, less interested in TTM. Uh, and it's uh, it's um, like all in ICU. It's um, it's a team. It's a, it's a teamwork. Okay, uh, Jean Baptiste, thanks a lot for your uh, question. Of course, I know it's a very challenging topic. We will have uh, many sessions dedicated to cardiac arrest in the next EasyCam uh, at the end of March in Brussels. Uh, your analysis of the guidelines uh, have been very good for a very practical recommendation for our uh, listeners. And of course, I hope to see you in the next uh, 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 chat, maybe for your next uh, randomized trial in this uh, setting. It was a pleasure. See you. Yes, thank you.